Welcome to Season 2, Episode 15 of The Tree of Geek. My name's Josh, and I'm joined tonight with my co-host, Michael. What's up? And tonight, we are looking at Part 2 of our little mini-series of A Christmas in July. This one is A Die Hard Christmas in July. And no matter what Bruce Willis says, it is a Christmas movie. He may not be on vacation, but we will be soon. This is true. This is very true. (laughs) So we're going to go and dive in to the Die Hard series, all five movies, as well as speculations of what might be coming in the future, what might not be. Maybe some commercials. Yeah, some commercials. Uh, And, of course, why we believe things might not go much further, but we'll get to all that eventually. First, as we always do, we're going to talk about a little bit of what's new in our worlds. Michael, however, before you go ahead and share your geekdom, your new in your world of geekdom, we have a special guest with us tonight. Yeah, we do. So without further ado, I'm just going to let him introduce himself because I I know... Of course you are, because you cannot properly do it. I've seen the way you talk on here, you insidious boob, your girly man voice. I am Skeletor, ruler of Eternia. Well, welcome to the Tree of Geeks, Skeletor. What's new in your uh, your world of geekdom? There's rumors in Hollywood that there's going to be another Masters of the Universe made. There is, and they actually, they did you see they just cast him? Oh, I've seen who they've cast. Beastman's taking bigger shits than this boy. Nicholas Glitzen, little glittery boy. He thinks he could be my nemesis. You know how tall he stands? You, you know about heights. How tall does he stand? Well, I, I did look it up, and I'm pretty sure he's like six foot. And how tall was Mr. Lundgren? Uh, I don't know, like six, five, six, six. Yes, he was a mountain of a man. Who, how, how can this man destroy me? He can't. Well, Nobody how, can. How, how tall should He-Man be? Seven foot. They should uh, cast the Undertaker. And isn't He-Man blonde? He is blonde. This guy's going to use the Haunter section of Walmart. You know when you go up in the screen and start dinging at you? We're recording, I know! I'm recording you with my eyes. Oh, to dye his hair. Yes, to dye his hair. Gotcha. Whatever scarpets match the drapes doesn't matter. Moving on. Well, so, speaking of which, I mean, the new movie, we got a new actor. Who's going to be playing you? The rumor is Pedro Pascal. I don't think that's true. Why wouldn't he be able to play me? Because he's playing everything right now. He's you... busy. Busy doing what? This is bullshit. I, my agent said that Pedro Pascal shall pay me. It was supposed to be Nicolas Cage at first, and I said, no, he already screwed up one skeletal man. It was a ball of fire of fury and rage. Inside my heart when I watched that movie, it was gloriously stupid. All right, well, I think we're going to move on. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Push me to the side. You will feel my wrath. Do, do you want me, is it Mr. Skeletor? Just Skeletor? Daddy to you. Yeah, I'm not going to call you that. I mean, this is this is ridiculous. Cut out all my parts. I've Security. not. Security. Hey, let get your hands off, Beast Man. Where are I? That was intense. That, that okay. wow. wow. Sorry Dude. about that. Uh, he did not seem that intense when we uh, interviewed him earlier. Yeah, he was like even keeled. Like he was drinking his macchiato. He was good to go. He had his feet kicked up. He's like, "This is going to be great." We we're like, "This is cool." It seemed like yeah, that surfer vibe going. Osteoporosis must be setting in. Oh man. Yeah. Dude. But Michael, what's new in your world? Since yeah, we're gonna we're gonna segue away from that. Oh uh, well, I mean, we talk about some other crazy people. Uh, there uh, the the two fairy or somebody left. Uh, this comic book on my desk, the first appearance of uh, Deadpool in the Wolverine comic uh, it was that Wolverine uh, 88, I do believe. Yeah, it's, it's pretty sweet. So that there's that. The first time they ever fought each other. Yes. Uh, the one has uh, where he says Nessa cakes in it. <laughs> She's a blue skinned lady because um, I'm pretty sure Vanessa's uh, blue skinned in the comic. She's not Caucasian. Yeah, but Marina Brackern, she does. She does great. So, oh, she does. I got no, no, no qualms there. Well, didn't you say that was the first comic book you ever bought with your own money? It was. I, I collect, like I said, I'll tell the story again. I collected a lot of pop cans out there in Michigan and uh, went and bought it at the, uh, the local store. You grocery store, actually. Dig it out, put it next to this one, and take a picture for uh, our socials. That way can do that. people can see how well read <laughs> yours is. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's pretty crazy. Hey, you! Hey, hey, hey shut the door! Come on! Jeez, he's... <laughs> Man, just came right back in there. I have a feeling he might be popping up again. I don't know. We better get not. a restraining no. order. That's crazy. Ridiculous, man. Oh, jeez. Anything well, else going on for you? Uh, not really. No. No? Well, what, I... What about you, man? <laughs> uh, same area. Comic books. 
I mean, big surprise coming from me, I'm sure. I, I went to that new comic shop again, looked around, found a few things that I needed to, you know, fill in some holes in my collections. And I got talking to the guy, the owner, and he informed me that someone came in or contacted him at least with a bulk of books that he would like to sell. In that bulk of books is The Incredible Hulk number 181, the very first appearance of Wolverine. Now, technically, he was at the very end, like the last page of 180. That was his intro cameo. This is the first official appearance as far as collectors are concerned. Well, it's his full body. Yeah. That being said, he told me that if he does strike a deal with this gentleman, he'll sell it to me for pretty much what he gets it at. That's a pricey man. That'd be a pricey uh, I mean, book. So he dude. told me he he's not a professional grader, but he roughly estimates probably a six out of ten. It's decent shape, but it's obviously worn. So I did a little research on my own. Man, a four out of ten still sells for like fifteen hundred bucks. So a six is probably closer to three grand easy. That's not. I um, do not yeah. see any way I can justify that. That's too much spicy gravy for this guy. Well, I don't know how I could justify buying that and stay married at the same time. I'm pretty sure she would kill me or divorce me. So, oh yeah. Dumbies, so man. even though that is one of what they call you know a grail, that's that super sought after. Ah, depending on what he says, I'm gonna probably more than likely have to pass it up. Yeah, it's probably I don't the think, smarter choice, but. I mean, I'd even go three, four hundred bucks on it, but I know for a fact he's not going to do that unless it's like one page of it, you know? Right now. Uh, so, unfortunately, I'm probably going to have to pass up the opportunity. That's... I did get to hold one, though, at a, that Comic-Con we went to. The one guy let me hold the uh, Hulk 181 slabbed, but the price tag on it clearly said $1,500. And my wife just looked at me and said, don't even think about it. Yeah. So <laughs> You think about putting that self image back down, and that's... I wish I had something like that, man. Because like Wolverine's like, Wolverine is uh, dare I say the tits. I mean, I've got I've got a lot of number yeah. ones. I've got a lot of hard to find ones. None of them are that like super iconic, sought after by every collector like issue. I mean, I have a couple that you know they're they're rarer, but they're not impossible to find. For something like that to just fall into his lap, like from That's a lucky. A, I mean, I. Start stopping at yard sales again and just, hey, do you have any comic books? Nope. Okay, see ya. I'm looking for those people who are just like, oh, I'm cleaning out house. These have been here for 20, 30, 40, Sorry, 50 mama. years. Here, yeah, 50 bucks for the box. <laughs> you, you might get lucky, man. I mean, it's Jackson it's, Comics number two. That's where <laughs> yeah. Well, I do got one thing I forgot. But. Too bad. We don't really have time to, no, go ahead. We always have time for the champion MJF to come back. So I started dabbling back into wrestling just a little bit. Uh, because I saw that MJF has come back to wrestling. So uh, I've speaked my interest. I was kind of kind of out of it for there for a little bit. But Who's MJF? Maxwell Jacob Friedman. He's better than you, and you know it. Uh, he's come back to wrestling. He's uh, He was the former champion. Uh, he took some time off, and now he's back. Nice. So I might start watching wrestling again. It's possible. i got to find time you know, to record it and then watch it. If I had time to record it and then watch it at work, that'd be great. But I don't. Cause then, like then, you, they're three hours long, but I can fast forward through them. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like, oh, I don't like, care about this fight or oh, commercials. You want to do a backflip, a couple of triple Lindy's off the Nakatomi Towers, and uh, get into this? I do. I mean, well, tie on, like on your hose flop for and me. get ready. So swing a diehard Christmas in July, ladies and gentlemen. We are diving into all five of the diehard movies, starting in 1988. With Die Hard 1, coming in an 8.2 out of 10 on IMDb, rated R. 94% on Rotten Tomatoes. Is it that high? Yeah. Wow. Directed by John McTiernan, starring Bruce Willis, Bonnie Bedelia, the amazing Alan Rickman, Reginald Vell Johnson, and many more. Did I do that? Yes, he did play the dad <laughs> on... Family matters. Family matters. He sure did. He's wearing you down. He's wearing you down. He is. Yeah. Michael, do you want to give us a, a quick overview? What was the first Die Hard movie about? Uh, well, hard-nosed New York City cop John McClane wages a one-man war against a band of cold-blooded thieves in Los Angeles in this contemporary action classic. Yeah, they're not just average thieves. They're, uh, how does Hans Gruber put it, exceptional thieves? Well, I mean, it's Alan Rickman. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so you got Bruce Willis as John McClane, Alan Rickman as the amazing Hans Gruber, uh, Alexander Godunov as Carl, Bonnie Bedelia as Holly Gennaro, not Holly McClane, 
Um, yeah, so a lot of really, really cool people in here. And you'll find out as we go through the series, there's going to be a couple lethal weapon people. They might be showing up in some of these movies. Might be. Maybe one of the agents, Johnson and Johnson, you know, not related. But yeah, so uh, these people are going to go to the Nakatomi Towers. Uh, they appear to be terrorists at first, but then we find out that they're just looking to heist all the bearer bonds out of the Nakatomi vault. And, Essentially uh, untraceable untraceable checks. bear bonds think of his yeah. checks yeah yeah and uh, john mcclain's coming to visit his wife for christmas they're a strange he's in la he's in new york um he's rubbing his little toesies on the carpet trying to be calm after he had a little bit of an argument with her and then shit pops off and now uh now he's got a gun ho, on ho, christmas ho. eve yes christmas eve because this is a christmas movie yeah, even though bruce willis says it's not but i mean he doesn't know anything he, yeah yeah <laughs> And that that's not a slam. It's just like he said this way back when, when he was yeah. on Friends. Yeah. And he knew stuff then. But this is the movie that gave us that the iconic, you know, crawling through the air ducts. It gave us the Yippie Kaye quote that yes. so many Because he's partial to Roy Rogers. So many people used over the years. Yes. And I don't mean in movies. I mean people I know like Oh, just your general everyday slime. Side note, you are not as cool <laughs> at all as John McClain. <laughs> I, this is one of those movies that while Michael has said before, like Lethal Weapon was like the pinnacle of action movies. The year before. The year before. I am a firm believer that Die Hard changed the whole uh the whole formula. It went from Buddy Cop to Lone you know, Lone Ranger in a, an impossible situation, making the best of it. And as you'll see, the impossible becomes more and more impossible as the movies go on. But that's well, trust me, we'll definitely get to that. Got any uh, behind the scenes of trivia for this one? Uh, I, I have one thing that I always found to be amazing about this. What's that? Uh, first of all, spoilers. 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 Spoilers, 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 spoilers you idiots. idiots. For all diehard associated franchise anything. So, in other words, the movies and anything else that might have something to do with Die Hard. If you're like, wait a minute, I didn't get to see those commercials for Advanced AutoZone or whatever yet. Like, what the hell? Uh, there's a John McClane Die Hard commercial. So, Advanced sorry. AutoZone? Really? Yeah. <laughs> really? yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jeez. The, the pet boys of Advanced AutoZone. O'Reilly. So, Auto. <laughs> you've been warned. Spoilers for all of the Die Hard franchise. Coming up right now. So if you haven't seen anything or you don't want to be spoiled, we'll give you a moment. Go watch the movies. Okay, now you're back. That's amazing. Right, I'm back. glad, man. Now you guys are all prepped and ready to roll. So the so what's the what, do you, what trivia you got? The biggest behind the scenes thing I have takes place at the end of the movie. So do you have anything before that, before I jump right to Mine's the Mine's not in chronological order. Okay. Of just tidbits of info. So if you've seen the movie... If you're listening, I hope you have. If you haven't seen it, that's not my problem anymore. Well, you can still pause. Yeah, but you we can. prefer you didn't because we got to get going. We, we gave you that opportunity. The scene where Hans Gruber is hanging off the building and then he drops to his death. Hans Gruber, our main villain, Alan frickin' Rickman, amazing. Mr. Potter. So he, he was hanging off of a real, I think that it was something like 30 foot or something like they wanted a, a nice little drop to a happy mat or whatever it was below. Count of three, we're going to drop you. One. Now, wait a minute. Is that, is that, we go on three or is that one, two, and then three? Doesn't matter. <laughs> they dropped oh, him. I love Lethal Weapon. They literally said uh, one and dropped him. That they did. And so the look of pure fear, surprise, whatever you want to call it on his face at that moment is 100% authentic. He did not know he was about to drop at that moment. He was not prepared. And it's 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 cinematic gold. It, it is. I mean, that look on his face, it's pure. And the music. And the music that plays by Michael Kamen at the oh same my time. Gosh. So it's when I, so well done. When I did the rewatches of all this, I actually watched Die Hard 1 before I watched Lethal Weapon because I'd seen it so many times. I was like, oh, I'm going to watch Die Hard in, instead. And then I went back and forth. But I was like, man, this music is just... I know this music. Started doing a little digging, and I don't know why I didn't know this for years, but I was like, hey, Michael Kamen. It's, yeah. Same guy. <laughs> same dude doing the same exact kick-ass music. Not as much as the brown in it, but... Not as 80s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the the high, you know, the high big crescendos of things, uh, he definitely did in there. Oh, absolutely. Uh, do you got anything else? No, that's the big one that I have for that. I don't really have a lot of trivia for uh, for Die Hard. Well, uh, supposedly this was going to be a Commando sequel. Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, was in talks to do this with a Melissa Milano. 
Uh, I guess he was supposed to go rescue Alyssa Milano, his daughter from Commando, in in the uh, the building. Uh, but Arnold uh, passed on it. Um, it was pitched as Rambo in an office building. <laughs> um, the film was based on, eventually it was based on the novel Nothing Lasts Forever, which is a sequel to a movie called The Detective. There's a book, The Detective, and then the novel, but they did a movie called The Detective, which is like a prequel to this. So the guy that plays in that movie is Frank Sinatra. Oh. Now, because they did this movie back in like the 50s, he was contractually obligated to be in the running to be in a sequel. Well, because this is technically a sequel to that in a way, they were they were like, well, maybe we can get this 80-year-old Frank Sinatra <laughs> to be in the sequel. Could you imagine him uh, <laughs> crawling around air ducts yeah. singing? Yeah, so, so that didn't happen. Um, but some of the things that were kept from uh, the book are uh, the character called, I think, John Leland instead of John McClane. Uh, but they have him crawling through the air ducts in the book. When he sends the C4 bomb down the elevator shaft, that's in the book. When he jumps off the exploding roof with the fire hose, that's in the book. And the gun taped to his back at the end is in the book as well. I should pick up the book. Yeah, I mean, I heard it. it sounds like it could read. be a good read. Yeah. yeah. Um, possible castings of John McClane, Frank Sinatra, as we said before. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yes. Uh, Stallone, Richard Gere, Burt Reynolds. Uh, Harrison Ford, Clint Eastwood, Robert De Niro, Don Johnson, Richard Dean Anderson, MacGyver. Yeah. little SG one there. Uh, Al Pacino. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And finally, Mel Gibson. So this could have been a very different movie. <laughs> yes. It, 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 there's wow. Richard Gere. I don't know, man. Richard Gere's, Richard Gere's kind of nuts, man. I don't know. Maybe that, that would, uh, but Bruce Willis, uh, received a then unheard of $5 million. Uh, which was approved by the Fox president at the time, Rupert Murdoch. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, I heard he's, he's, he's a different type of a cat, too. Because the movie, like most of the scenes were shot out of order, some of the f uh, finagling had to be done because so John McClane runs into Hans Gruber on the roof. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I'm, I'm Bill Clay, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, oh, they, hey, Alan Rickman, they would said, can you do an American accent? And he did like some sort of surfer accent thing that ended up being the Bill Clay. Like, well, we need to use this. Well, the problem was they're like, well, John McClane would know who he is. He saw him kill Takaki. So they had to go back and, and finagle to where John McClane was under the table and things were in his way. So he sees Takaki get killed, but he never actually sees who kills him. So it makes sense that he doesn't know that he is faking it, even right. though he kind of figures it out right away because John McClane's not an idiot. Yeah. And that is the the trivia behind the scenes I, I have of this. Um, of course, as I said, in the Lethal Weapons, I won't get into it here. There's there's plenty of other information to find on the internet about this. But there's so many things going on with John McTiernan and Arnold Schwarzenegger and Predator and the Shane Black and just everybody with Lethal Weapon. They're all intermixed in this. I mean, you have um, the guy that tortures McClane. I mean, the tortures Riggs in Lethal Weapon. He ends up in this movie is uh right. one of the the henchmen who like steals the the stuff out the, the food there under the counter yeah he, he grabs a yeah. candy bar one of the agent johnson's was the guy telling murtaugh he has a new partner like there's just so how crazy that you get two of the classic 80s dirt bags in this when you get paul gleason playing Dwayne t robinson the deputy police chief and then you also get richard thornburg played by william atherton these two in the 80s and 90s played douchebags in like every movie they were in. And then you got like a twofer in this. Like, it's just crazy. Growing up, like watching this movie, I always hated Paul Gleason because I just. Like, <laughs> because with the bull, you get the horn. <laughs> like, just. I mean, I've, I've talked about this about other movies before. That whole trope of, oh, well, why should we believe you? Well, because he's in the building. He's literally hands on right now. And I just, I could never stand him. Like his, oh. Yeah, Robert Davi is the other guy. He's, he was just in uh, Maniac Cop a little bit before this, uh, or maybe even right after this. I don't know, around the same time where he played Detective. Like all these people were like in the same genre of movies everywhere. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, like, out of 10, what do you give this movie? Like, honestly, I easily give this an 8.5. I give it a nine, man. I give it a solid nine. This movie's fucking badass. I mean, it's dated, but at the same time, it holds up. What's dated about this movie? All of the technology. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Smoking in the building. You want me to keep going? <laughs> like, there's a lot. But it holds up because, like, when you watch this, you're not thinking, like, oh, it's a, a new action movie. No, you know what it is. You know it's that classic, cult classic 80s, you know. 
don't know if it's a cult classic. I think it's a widespread classic. I don't okay. know, Jimmy. Yeah. No, but to be fair, though, uh, a couple years ago, uh, I had this friend I worked with, and uh, he had this other friend, like his girlfriend or something, and they they wanted to borrow some movies. I was like, well, here, borrow Die Hard. And they're like, what the fuck is that? And like, no, seriously, they had no idea what Die Hard was. I was like, dude, what you, what, man, shit, man, take Die Hard. So I get it back like a couple of days later and the girl's like, that was the dumbest, like what, what they were shooting their guns, pew, 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 pew. Like it was horrible. It was so stupid. I just, oh, oh man, I wanted to do mean things. Uh, <laughs> I was like, how dare you mis- mismarch a classic movie that, yes, Lethal Weapon set the, the bar for like action cop, buddy cop, you know, type movies, the but Die Hard, like, set the bar for, like, let's just do some nonsensical, blowing up, oh, yeah. crazy bullshit. Scale down the side of a building on a fire hose. Wait. Did you see the Mythbusters where they tried to see if they, that you could actually no. do that? Can yeah. It, can it be done? Um, It was kind of busted. I think they had to shoot the glass a couple more times or something before it would work. And then the injuries that John McClane would have taken by ripping through that glass <laughs> would have just... Movie magic, man. Different universe, different physics. Yep. Sugar glass. Sugar glass, yes. The stuff that you like, the bottles you break over your head yep. and all that, yeah. This movie from beginning to end, I'm telling you, is just the, the, the little... It's the dialogue that really gets me a lot in this one. As uh, Lethal Weapon, I think they're so close and sharp with the dialogue that not a whole lot is even wasted in this movie either. Mm-hmm. Like, everything, like, kind of matters. Well, and it's, I always love that, like, like Riggs and Lethal Weapon was a... Sp- you know, special ops. Uh, Murdoch, not really. He was just kind of. Yeah, he was in Vietnam. He probably went through. You know, I mean, but this is combat just a, training. But literally, average Joe. It's cop. just a, just New York cop. Yeah, like he hard boiled cop that just doesn't quit. You know, our our friend uh, Josh, the other Josh, yeah. has said that he his favorite part of this movie, and I kind of agree with him that it is really amazing. Is you can slowly see McLean just go down. The, the the madness just grows and grows and grows as the movie goes on. He just loses his mind. I guess there's like some theory out there too that this is kind of is in, in, in his head or something. Like he was just losing it. I don't know. I didn't go down. I didn't subscribe to it. So I just kind of like mm. went through. But like he just, as it goes on, he just, he, it's like he's a mad hatter. He just kind of like loses. Like he's, he's just burnt out. He's like, he doesn't want to do anymore. He's just like freaking out. And I love it. He just goes down the mouth of madness. Wow. Yeah, I can see that. Can What's see. your favorite part of this movie? Like, if you had to pick a favorite part. Like, not just your favorite line, but, like, your favorite sequence, say. I think my favorite part would be just the very beginning setup. Like, that whole first thing where Carl and Theo go in, they kill the guard. It's just the slickness that everybody's just... When they all drive in and all the vehicles come together at the, at the right time, mm-hmm. they go down, like, one goes up a ramp, one goes down a ramp, and they're just, like, it's just so unison, so uniformed. Right. It, it's like I'm watching a marching band or something. It's just like so perfect. It's a little morbid. But when I can't remember his name now, um, the, the sleazeball co worker. Oh, um, when he says that he knows John. Well, like, yeah, like they take him into the room and he's trying to strike up a deal and he's just being that, oh, I'm. I'm amazing. I can, you know, negotiate this. And yeah, what am I, a method actor, Hans? Put no, the gun I, away, babe. Yeah, and when he's like, you know, dude, get out of there. Ellis. No, no. Bam. You tell you dumb son of a bitch, you tell him you don't know me. I just and met this idiot. I, I think that's the point in the movie where you realize, like, okay, maybe anything is possible right now. Because they set him up to be kind of a, a higher character, at least you thought they did. He, he, he does $100 million deals for lunch. This and will be a piece of cake. Then he gets shot in the face hole. Hans, Bubby, I'm your white knight. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, like Carl's going to kill him right away. I like how Hans just takes his hand and goes, no, no, no. Hold on a minute. I must have missed 60 minutes. <laughs> I'm not going to do an Alan Rickman impression. I, I No way. No fucking way, man. I wouldn't even not besmirch Alan Rickman in that way. I'll do I'll do the Snape, but that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Waste uh, your mind. <laughs> I love that movie. Harry Potter? I know. It's oh, oh any, <laughs> anything with Alan Rickman. Yeah, dude, I'm trying to think, because um, a running thing for me used to be, like, I've never seen a bad Mel Gibson movie. Now, this was years and years ago. He's he's had a couple in the last 10 years, that maybe. But it's like, can I really find a movie that has Alan Rickman in it that sucks? Not that I've seen every Alan Rickman movie. There for a while, I did see every Mel Gibson movie. So, <laughs> um, 
True. And the man he is what he is, but I, I enjoyed a lot of his movies back in the day. Um, but like Alan Rickman's just like he's Bruce Willis, yes, great. Uh everybody else like does their part. Um the dude that ends up in Walker, Texas Ranger, Theo, like he's even cool in this. Uh it's even Carl, who was apparently like super drunk all the time. And he died early. I guess he had like cirrhosis of the river liver or something, so he died way early. Um yeah, the, I guess the director or producer somebody said that he was like drunk all the time. He just drank and drank. He was like some like German dude that just drank all the time. Really? Yeah, um he was in Waxwork too. He was the main bad guy I watched a couple weeks ago. Wow. I was like, that's Carl from Die Hard. <laughs> what the hell? So he did have a movie role or two after Die Hard. Well, that's good. Who's your favorite? Yes. Now you gotta take Bruce Willis McLean off the table, pay Hans Gruber. Who is other than those two, who is your favorite character in this movie? Probably the I can't remember his name. Uh the, the dude who steals the candy bar. Because he was supposed <laughs> to be just a throwaway henchman. And that was because that was a full there you go. There's He's some been a throwaway henchman in a lot of movies. Well, like there's Angus Gone Bill and Ted. A little trivia for you. That was actually completely improv. He just reached down, grabbed a candy bar, pocketed it. And that like solidified him in the the Hall of Fame of memories for that movie. Like that is a known iconic scene, not iconic. Yeah. Standard two yeah. by two formation. But I just I don't know. I always liked him because that's realism. You know what I mean? Like yeah, you're not gonna stand guard and look down. And, oh, I'm hungry. Well, I'm busy. I'm working. No, you're gonna steal a candy bar. Oh, that looks, was the baby Ruth. Is that what he like? Something like yeah, that. Baby Ruth. I sort of like the dude, too, that uh, he looks like Huey Lewis from Huey Lewis in the News. He's the guard that makes it to the very end. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, how did this guy live this entire time? <laughs> the dude from the lobby, you know? Yeah, it's, uh, man, oh, man, just so many good sequences in this. Um, Bonnie Bedelia playing uh, Gennaro. You know, it's just, wow. I, I, I've lost, I don't know why I've lost all my words, because it's just, it's so hard to describe how amazing this is, because the world already knows how amazing this this movie is from beginning right. to end. And there's a reason that, you know, it spawned former movies after this. Um, yeah, I definitely, definitely put this one way up high. It is my favorite Die Hard. Okay. Full disclosure, favorite Die Hard. Um, now I do like a good bit of Die Hard movies, but this one, I don't think there's really a lot for people or, or any movies after this to really, to match this one, maybe closely, but not, but definitely not all the way. They might get up to like the fourth floor, but they're not getting up to like the 20th. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I even like when the, the one dudes who I think it's Vigo from Ghostbusters too, when they're taking the missiles, they're trying to run down the hallway and they're I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> you know, whatever they're saying, a bunch of fucking gibberish. <laughs> like even that, part, he like drops a missile. <laughs> what are you doing, man? Like, oh, it's just awesome. Like McLean, he's like smashing against the glass. He's and he's up. Well, at first he's jumping up and down. He's like, yeah, motherfuckers, you're here, you're here. And then like the cops just like turn away and he's like, no, no, no. Like you just see like him just go crazy and go crazy and go crazy and he's just willing to do anything. Yeah. It's it's awesome. Well you like uh like the other Josh said, like you literally get to see his descent and I don't want to say into madness, but like pure despair. What else are you gonna do? I mean, you're you've taken literally out. by yourself and you see help coming just for it to turn back around. I mean at every turn, you think you finally thwarted these guys. You finally stopped these guys. You taken out this guy. You took out Carl's brother. You took out the other guys. You got the dude on the table. Yep. You know what are you gonna do now? You know he should have shot when he th 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 and he kills him underneath the table. Like he's taken out everybody, but he like Hans ain't quitting. Like it just keeps getting worse. Yeah. And then obviously you got uh, uh, Mr. Winslow. I'm just gonna call him Winslow. Al. Al, Al Powell. Yeah. You know, like they. The thing is, they didn't. Sh no scenes together until the very end scene. And a lot of these movies, like anything to do with telephones or they're in separate rooms, like they never really filmed together or anything. This is all kind of cut together. So I give like a lot of these actors in both these series a lot of credit to be able to play off what they did because when you hear those conversations over the, the over the microphone, uh, the walkie-talkie, you, you, it's believable. You think like him and Hans really are fucking going toe-to-toe -to -toe and they're not. You know, yeah. It's movie magic. Banger of a movie, man. Banger of a it's... movie. I wish we talked about this one last <laughs> when it comes to this this episode, but we got to go in order because them's the rules. We are not saving the best for last. No, no, we are not, but we're not there yet. Uh, in fact, we're going to move on a little bit to Die Hard 2 from when? 1990. We're jumping ahead two years. Directed by Rennie Harlan. You know what other famous movie he did? Well, he did one of the Nightmare on Elm Streets. I think he did Dream Warriors. False. Or one of those ones. Don't crucify me if I'm wrong. I should know this. I'm a horror movie guy, but he did do one of the Nightmare on Elm Streets. IMDb gave it a 7.1. 
Oh, and by the way, total death, confirmed deaths in the original Die Hard is 23. It's a good bit of uh, dead people. Confirmed deaths in Die Hard 2 is 271. So, yeah, yeah a little bit of a difference there. Dream Master. He did the Dream Master, not okay. Dream Warriors. My bad. I knew it was one of the dreams. What do you give this Die Hard 2? Well, I mean, looking at the fact that they gave it a 69% on Rotten Tomatoes, um, and it made $117 million, I will give... Well, that's for Die Hard 2. Is that what you're asking me? Die Hard 2 or Die Hard 1? <laughs> you said Die Hard 2. Uh, I give Die Hard 2 an 8 out of 10, a solid 8 out of 10 for sure. Okay. Maybe maybe 8 point something. It's close to a, to a 9, but and probably no, I'll just give it an 8. Not really thinking about it, 8. Yeah, just thinking about the airplanes a minute. I'll, I'll give it an 8. Die yeah. Hard 2, I gave a 7.5. 7.5? 7. Yeah. So apparently John McClane is at the wrong place at the wrong time again. Uh, now, I took all these synopsis. I went to Amazon.com. And because I wanted to know what the original taglines on like the DVD boxes. Now, I couldn't really find the VHS boxes. So I was like, what? It, <laughs> like, because you can go to Amazon and watch all these. Right. I do believe. Um, it's, it, so it says the plot, uh, the wrong place at the wrong time. Again, exclamation point. Uh, LA cop John McClane takes explosive action against terrorists taking over the Washington, D.C. airport where his wife's plane is due to arrive. <laughs> That's a very, very thin <laughs> plot synopsis. And you're going to love the ones going on from here because there's one of them that makes no sense. <laughs> it is absolutely a horrible plot synopsis that they give. But yeah, so John McClane, he's at an airport. He's waiting for his wife to land. He kind of notices something's kind of strange. There's been some political things going on. You know, there's somebody who's going to get transferred, some dude from Mexico or South America. I think it was Cuba. Oh, actually, so here's the thing, though. A little tidbit info before we go any further so I don't forget it. So this Esperanza is coming from the same place, the same island that Arnold Schwarzenegger's character, John Matrix, rescued his daughter from in Commando. So though supposedly, and that is uh, supposedly the same place that Predator takes place in the jungles in that area. So, I mean, that was, you know, John McTiernan and all these things. There's this theory that Commando, Predator, and Die Hard are all the same universe. Oh, that'd be great. I mean, that means that you get Danny Glover and Die Hard somewhere, possibly because of him playing Hardigan in Predator 2. Hey. That's great. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, so this they're they're gonna bring this guy over. Um, well, the they take these dudes take over the airport. They're not sure if they're terrorists or who it is at first. And John McClane tries to figure out who it is, but he keeps getting railroaded by the stupid <laughs> the airport cops that somehow have a shit ton of authority. I don't know if it's because it's DC or what, but towing yeah. his car. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so this one is still rated R, is the same as the first one. But apparently there were so many fucks in the script, uh, and they were running dialogue. Uh, the guy that plays the traffic controller, like the main dude. Art Evans is Leslie Barnes, the airport chief engineer. Is that him? Or no, uh, Fred Thompson. Fred Thompson. Okay. Uh, the air traffic flight director. One of those guys. Can't remember which one he is. But he couldn't take the, the script any, like seriously. All He's like, dude, we, we got to stop this. The big tall dude. He's like, they're, they're, like I can't. Like, he's saying the F word every other word. Like, I can't do this. So they rewrote it a little bit and took a lot of the F bombs out of there. Because yeah, I guess they were just going and going and going. Nah, they're ruining art. <laughs> beautiful beautiful art there's additional cast members i mean you got robert patrick shows up in this john leguizamo's in this john leguizamo apparently claimed because he was super short that, that he didn't get to say anything he got one line and it's kind of like dubbed over by another person mm. and robert patrick doesn't say much but apparently uh it was enough to get him an ad audition for a movie called terminator 2 and it, yep. it helped him get that role i believe he says you look like sitting ducks because yeah. it's, it's when it turns around. Yeah, it's it's when they're going into the wing of the airport under construction to get to the like, radio What do we tower. look like, idiots or something? Yeah. And he's uh, like, no, you look like sitting ducks. He turns around with a, a machine gun. I think that's literally all he says. It might be. He doesn't say a lot. <laughs> because I think that's all I remember him saying, too. But then you, you do have one of my favorite actors in this, too. Who's that? William Sadler. So here's some Star Trek stuff for you. Oh, jeez. How about William Sadler? Uh, he was on Deep Space Nine. Uh, Section 31 Sloan is the character he plays, me messes with Dr. Bashir. Section 31 is like the black ops we don't ever talk about in Star Trek. But then the one pilot that they're playing crashes is played by the guy that plays Miles O'Brien on Deep Space Nine and The Next Generation. So you got, and, and trust me, the Star Trek, they'll be brought up again later on in this series. Okay. Uh, so yeah, you have two Deep Space Nine actors and Die Hard. Well, how about that? How about that? And of course, Richard Thornburg shows back up. Why not? He's on a plane. 
has a restraining order against John McClane's wife. Oh, man. Because like, she uh, punched two of his teeth out. Yes. Which, I mean, it didn't look like that in the first one, but she must have really cracked him. Yeah, we're really good. good. We, we do have uh, Reginald Vell Johnson coming back in a brief cameo, just like an over-the-phone type thing. Got to run some prints. But he did get his uh, his few minutes back, which I was really glad to see. Yeah. I mean, it, it showed you that he wasn't just an obscure nobody well, character. They kept in touch. Yeah. Well, this yeah. series doesn't have a lot of people that come back. No. No, it no. doesn't. It's kind of like new new casts for the most of it, every movie. What are your uh what are you, what are your, some of your favorite parts of this one? So I think one of the things I love the most was the old school social engineering that we see. And by social engineering, that's a term where you essentially pretend like you belong in order to gain access to something. Uh Take it till you make it. Great example is uh there's a book I read not too long ago, it's called People Hacker, where her entire job, the girl who wrote it, the woman, was testing company security systems. Isn't that the plot of another Die Hard movie? Well, <laughs> uh, well, no, like, for real, though, a company security officer or whatever would hire her to, you know, break into the building or, you know, like physically break in without telling the actual security of the building it was happening. So like nobody knew but a couple choice people who approved it. Okay. And she would do everything from pretending like she belongs to like the that's, one that's thing. That's a pretender TV show. Well, the one that's thing in the is. book is she went out to the little smoke corner and sat there smoking a cigarette, waiting for people to come out, join the conversation, and walked back inside with them. Boom, she gained access to the building. Social engineering is the idea of like you said, kind of like fake it till you make it, pretending like you belong, making yourself pushed into that situation. We saw Bruce Willis's character do that a That's couple it. of different times. Like uh, the one point where he was, you know, hey, I need access into that room. Why? Well, you know, I do. Okay, open it up. Or after he kills the guy in the luggage room and he goes back to get the fingerprints. He just flashed a badge real quick. Oh, yeah, yeah, we changed policy. This is this is how we do it now. We take fingerprints, you know, right away. And, Nobody asks questions, because if you act like you have the authority and you know what you're doing, you're golden. Do you know how many people at my job, I work in IT, I'll just say that, I can walk into their office and say, hey, I need to run some updates on your computer, and oh, okay, and they just get up and walk away. People I've never met, they don't ask questions. Well, hey, can, yeah, I need your password quick. Oh, yeah, here, they'll write it down. Do you know how easy it would be for somebody, if they could gain access to a building, to just, with the confidence, walk in, pretend like they, you know, belong, and they could easily wreak havoc on stuff? Or in this case, John McClane used it to, you know, get into places and do things. And I just, I don't know, I love that aspect of it. I loved seeing a different side of not just brute force. I just figured he always rolled the 20 on charisma. Well, yeah, there's probably that too. <laughs> that and the, 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 the janitor helps him a lot. Oh, but No, that, yeah. that's a cool take. I never really thought about it that way, but that that's pretty nifty. And you know. of course, the one-liners. I mean. Yeah, there's a couple good ones in there. Uh, my, I think one of my favorites from it was, well, there's two that I've written down that are like top tier for me. And the one was when he was on the phone with uh, Al. And Al says like, you know, you're not pissing at someone else's pool, are you? Saying <laughs> like, hey, what are you doing out there? And he replies with, yeah. And I'm all out of chlorine. It's like, uh, what? What is that? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's cool to see him mouth battle with Dennis Franz's character and his yeah. brother that gives him the ticket. Um, oh, that's great. Yeah, he's just, he learns a lot of mouth battles with him in this whole entire thing. Even when he gets the, the general guy that shows up. Yeah. Um, which apparently they did not get along in real life. Uh, there was some issue they had somewhere uh, and nobody knows the specifics of it, but they talked to the director later on or the actor later on rather. And he said that Bruce Willis will never, uh, mess with me in public again or something. So something that, happened that, uh, somewhere. John Amos. Yeah. Yeah. For something happened somewhere and they didn't really? get along. Wow. So there was some real, there was actually tension between them on the set. Bruce Willis, as far as I know, hasn't said anything about it, but that guy had some issues. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, I've never really heard of Bruce Willis really rubbing a lot of people the wrong way, but I didn't really dig into his uh, old school tweets to see if he should be canceled or not. So well, yeah, that's we what we do now. We just got to go back about 13 years. I'm sure we'll find something. <laughs> and they'll be totally valid today. Of course. Of course. Yes. Uh, so I feel that every casting choice in this movie was perfectly done. Yeah, every single even the, person the, matched the character they were playing beautifully. The little guy that has uh, who's trying to solve the technical issues because their shit's yeah. down. And if we're, you were first talking about the social engineering, I thought you were talking about when he was sitting down with like the three or four other guys and they were troubleshooting issues. 
Oh no! And they're like, oh no, we can use this old wiring to put that there, and you, that was like some A Team Star Trek stuff with me. That every episode of Star Trek, they're like, well, if we run it through the deflector dish and we, you know, change the output to the input and uh, release See, the gas. Back then, <laughs> I mean, when signals and stuff like that were analog, you could do that type of thing. Now everything's so automated and, you know, well, we'll see it in a couple movies. But wasn't it so cool that the villains knew exactly what they were going to do? Oh, yeah. Like the like Hans Gruber knew everything in the beginning. Well, the up, FBI's running their shit play by play. We know what's going to happen. This one here. Well, yeah, their only way they could do this is if they went over here. Well, let's just ambush them if they do that. We're going to take, we're going to cut off their feet. We're going to cut off their ankles. We're gonna, they're not going to be able to do nothing. Everything. And then we're going to give them a penalty. It wasn't a over the weekend, hey, you know what we should do on Monday? No, this was like probably years months years in the planning every detail was covered yeah and this guy was like Sadler's character um Stuart was that his name yeah Stuart yeah, Stuart he was like worse than Gruber now he wasn't as cool as Gruber but he was like we're like he the whole entire plane and initially I guess they were supposed to it was supposed to be a cargo plane or something it was supposed to have more people on it some bigger thing or something um but they changed it just to the 747 I guess they had to go to Michigan to shoot some of these scenes around Alpena and an uh, uh, used to be an Air Force base up there. I guess some other airports couldn't accommodate what they were trying to do, and I think some of them wouldn't, didn't want them to be there. And none of the airlines, like act like Delta or Southwest, would put their names in this movie. So all the airlines that you see are all fake names. They're oh, like, we're course. not putting our names on. Like, they got a movie about terrorists taking over an airport, and like, no, <laughs> Delta Airlines will not be part of this. This isn't like Wonder Bread and Ricky Bobby, okay? right? Like, absolutely not. No, thank you. They're like, oh, we're on Delta. Are we gonna crash just like that movie? Yeah. No, but this is the movie where the old lady's on the plane that's sitting next to Holly Gennaro, and she has the lethal weapon uh, ad on the back of her People magazine or whatever it is. Do you know what else you see in this movie? At about, I've written down here, one hour and twenty minutes in, when they're circling the planes are you know just circling around there's a scene where they're walking around talking and they're playing the simpsons on the screen for people to watch i didn't i might have seen it just I, I, register i saw it and I, I caught it right away because we just talked about the simpsons in a recent episode ah uh, an actual aircraft or aircraft yeah what? an actual air controller said that this movie's baloney <laughs> and they're like <laughs> So if they're up there for an hour and there's no contact whatsoever with the tower, uh, the procedure is they just go away to another airport. They don't stick around till they're out of fuel. They just go somewhere else. If they cannot make contact within an hour or two, what they you just... you mean leave this horrible storm? Yeah. They're like, oh, yeah, we're just going to... Because some of the other ones were already redirected. But if they were... If there was like, especially if they would have gotten the beacon... Or, you know, that, that the transmission that they end up yeah. squeezing out there. They're like, no, we're out, dude. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah absolutely. Uh, no, we're just going to leave now. Come on. What were you going to say? I'm sorry. I totally stepped on your toesies. No, I was just saying The Simpsons are an hour and 20 minutes. I just thought that was funny. I I'd love to go back and try and see if we could, like, pinpoint what episode they were watching. A Trump episode or something. Yeah. I mean, with all The Simpsons predictions, maybe it predicted the, you know, <laughs> this. Possible. Uh, do you have any other tidbit of uh, any info, anything crazy on there? Oh, uh, Black and Decker sued the movie. Do you know that? Why? So there's a scene that gets cut from the movie. John uses a uh, Black and Decker drill to kill somebody. And ah. uh, yeah, so Black and Decker was like, hey, we, you did not ask for permission. You cannot have this in the movie. Uh, and they sued the movie. They eventually settled out of court. Nobody knows how much it was. Yeah. Uh, Sadler filmed his nude scene last. Oh, geez, um, So he could get in shape. So. In our last episode, we, we covered Lethal Weapon, and my boss walked by just as, you know, Mel Gibson's white ass is walking across the screen. Uh-huh. He did the same thing at this exact moment when William Sadler is doing his yoga or whatever naked in his room. Another very pale white ass on my screen. Gotta watch it, man. Gotta watch it. Yeah, not at work. <laughs> so overall, uh, overall thoughts. Overall thoughts. Fantastic movie. They definitely went a little more far-fetched on this one. The whole airplane thing, jumping out of a helicopter on top of the airplane. I mean... I'm just starting to like you, McLean. All I could think watching that was like, how long is this runway? They were going very slow. I don't know. You've flown before, right? Yeah. They yeah. <laughs> don't go that slow. They, they speed up pretty darn fast. I understand the flap thing was messed up, but like they never slowed down. <laughs> Airplanes are different in that universe. I, I, uh, yeah. They're different. They're made different, different aerodynamics. But I mean, like you have exploiting airplanes. 
exploding snowmobiles. You have all these firefights, and you know, every, and it's just when you think nothing can get crazier, it's like, wow, this movie's nuts. He jumps on an airplane. It, it was pretty wild, and that well, I, I mean, that's why we watch the movies. Well, that is wild. That is true. And I have to say, there was another one-liner because I said there was two that really got me. When he's with the reporter and they're in the elevator and he's looking for, you know, a vehicle and whatnot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she's like, you give me the story and I'll have your baby. And he's like, that's not the kind of ride I'm looking for. <laughs> I loved it. Oh, my word. You're going to find out later that he actually, at some point, that's why they really got divorced for part three, because he cheated on her with that reporter. Could you imagine that? <laughs> oh, my. And they stayed in the same hotel as Rianne and uh, Riggs. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Did you notice, uh, and I mean, they talk about it later, but did you actually notice in the church scene when they're closing on the church and he yells like, you know what to do, boys? They grab their uh, their magazines. Mm -hmm. They swap yeah. them out for yeah. the different colored ones. I've seen this movie like 13 times. Well, okay, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, uh, what, red was live rounds and blue were blanks or something like that? Like, Yeah, they're blanks. They, they started with red. And, and but they never actually red. like point out that that's why they were color coded. It's just, oh, hey, these are... Well, blocks. that's what John tells you later on in the movie. Well, and I was reading that. online. That's actually something that some like military groups do. They color code them like that so that they can swap out in emergency situations like quickly without guessing. Oh, what is this? That's a good idea. So I, I thought that was pretty neat that they incorporated something like that in. Pretty also, sweet. this movie takes place on Christmas Eve. <laughs> yes, yes, but it's not a Christmas movie. And you said about dating it. This is the one I was thinking of most. You have smoking in the airport. You have walking around the airport with a an alcoholic beverage, not stuck at a bar. You have wandering up to the radio tower without anybody stopping you. It was chaos at that point. I did like that. Uh, I mean, you went to get the facts, do the facts thing, and that chick hit on him too. Yes. It's just constantly, like, everybody's trying to get a piece of McLean in this yeah. movie. I, I mean, it really shows you that like pre-9-11... Uh, airport security was a whole different Yeah, thing. nobody's taking off their shoes or worrying <laughs> about their liquids. Yeah, you know, this movie's like jam-packed, too. I mean, like we talked about, you know, Dennis Franz, Leg Leguizamo, Patrick. I, I don't think the dialogue is as good in this one, but I think it makes up for of like the like the gunfights and the action, like at the the rebuilt terminal, the terminal they're rebuilding or, or fixing or, I don't know, just making it new, whatever that terminal is. Um, But then you also have where like he explodes with the eject seat and that part i don't like at all i think that that's horrible you mean because the grenades like sat in there oh, the cooking for half a minute <laughs> uh yeah I, i've thrown a grenade and they definitely go quicker than that i don't think i liked it as much as a kid but i think i appreciate this movie more as an adult as a kid i didn't like this movie i just i don't mean because it just wasn't die hard you know i forgot to talk about like in for die hard i was on the, the couch of my my grandmother's house and I think somebody had rented it. Maybe they let it there. My mom didn't know what Die Hard was. I didn't know what it was. I was probably, so this, the, I was probably like seven. It's the first time I saw Die Hard and I watched it with my mom. Wow. And we both were like, this movie rocks. Like man. I have a seven year old and I don't <laughs> yeah. think I would watch that with her. Yeah, it was the 80s, man. It was different. It was well, a different time in the 90s. Well, by the 90s, by the time I watched it. But yeah, I, this, overall though, I think it's, a, I think it is a worthy successor to Die Hard. I, I do. Oh yeah. Yeah. I don't rank it as high as the first one, but I still think it was a very, very well done sequel. It's, it's a fun movie. It followed it, the same basic formula, but it added some, you know, craziness. Yeah. yeah. Uh, some people say that their issue is that it, it's not claustrophobic like the first one. You know, it's not like, but then again, he's like, he is stuck in an airport. Yeah, well, then they didn't like the third one, did they? I do have issues with him running up and down underneath the airport and getting from place to place. I don't know if you've ever tried to catch a flight in an airport. Yeah, he got places. An airport that you've been to before, so you know where your terminal should be. He got places really fast. Like, I've never gotten that fast in an airport, like, ever. I've been in, like, I've been to O'Hare. I've been to, to Phoenix. I've been, like, all, you know. Yeah. No, there's no way, man. So I guess we should move on to part three, perhaps? Die Hard with a Vengeance. Oh, uh, real quick. Die Hard 2. Sometimes it's called Die Harder, but that's not an official title, even uh, though it is on some of the box art for the VHSs and DVDs. Interesting. But, but it's not actually called Die Harder. It's just Die Hard 2. Um, but I tell you what, there is an official name for Die Hard with a Vengeance, because that's what it is. They came out in 1995. So we get John McTiernan, who did the first one, comes back for this one. Uh, made $100 million at the box office. IMBD 7.6. Rotten Tomato 59%. Rogue NYC cop John McClane is back, this time dealing with a grisly mad bomber who delights in setting up puzzles that McClane's unwilling Harlem store owner partner 
solves. What? <laughs> that's that's what it says. I, I mean, it's not wrong, but. <laughs> but the, who writes these? Yes. <laughs> uh, so I have fresh off chat GPT. Oh, AI is better. Definitely. John McClane, a now disgraced and suspended detective, is called back into action when a bomb goes off in New York City. He's forced to team up with a Harlem shopkeeper, Zeus Carver, played by Samuel L. Jackson, by a terrorist named Simon, played by Jeremy Irons, who claims to have more bombs planted around the city, and Simon's true motives are gradually revealed, tying back to the events of the first film. Yeah, mine was better. Okay. <laughs> uh, casting. Uh, we got Bruce Willis back. Obviously, he's John McClane. Uh, that never changes. You said Jeremy Irons as Simon Peter Gruber. The spoiler, <laughs> he's the brother of Hans Gruber. Amazing. Yeah, Samuel Casting L. Jackson as Zeus. Uh, you can't go wrong with a Zeus. I mean Zeus. No. <laughs> I, I uh, love that. He kept calling him a Zeus, and he's like, my name is Zeus. <laughs> Zeus, motherfucker. Like, well, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I won't go through it. Uh, <laughs> I Larry Brigman is Walter Cobb. I like that dude's mustache was on point, man. Oh, yeah. Walter, yeah. I mean, there's so many people. There's a lot of people. Uh, there's also Sven Torvald as Carl. So Simon has a Carl and his brother had a Carl. Rolf, Gunther, Royman. Apparently a lot of the gibberish they were speaking was just straight up gibberish. The German that they were speaking in this movie was not actual German. Uh, a lot of people have watched this movie that speak German and go, what the hell are they even saying? <laughs> it yeah, doesn't make any damn sense. Because yeah. I had subtitles turned on when I watched it. <laughs> And it gave me like context. <laughs> so basically, it was hey, let's just program this. Yeah, just just yeah, mumble. So. Yeah. Um. This. Uh, all right. Nine. Nine. Ooh, nine. Uh. Do you have any uh tidbits of info before I give you mine? I like to let you go first. See what you got. Uh. You just like put me on the spot. Uh, it gives me a chance to read over mom before I start talking. Oh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh. So the biggest thing I have for this is the beginning, the very first. You know, Simon says. Has John McClane out in Harlem wearing a sign that says, I hate the N-word. Apparently, in the uh, the TV airings version, it simply said, I hate everybody. Yes. Because, you know, they didn't want to die, I assume. <laughs> right. Well, I guess that when he, in the movie, it's, uh, Simon says he's going to die in like so many minutes. Was it like uh, 14 minutes or something? Yeah, basically saying like, you're yeah. not going to last long out here. Well, apparently when Zeus goes to talk to him, and as soon as the people notice, it, it's like one minute more or something so it was like almost like in real time of watching the movie like the scene actually plays out like really watching it it's almost exactly the same time that simon said he was going to survive okay see that's really cool planet yeah, i don't know who researched that but i mean there, there's people that doesn't research on these things that's cool um so the script that was used was intended for a movie called simon says uh originally positioned as a brandon lee movie um and the character zeus was written with an actress in mind uh warner brothers bought the script and rewrote it as a lethal weapon sequel uh, yeah. But Warner Brothers later put the script in a turnaround only to be purchased by Fox and rewritten as a diehard movie. Uh, Lawrence Fishburne was supposed to be uh, Zeus. Uh, I guess he was mad about how much money they were going to pay him or something. So he said no. Uh, somebody said, well, you should probably do it. But by the time he got back, uh, they already had Sam Ek Sam Samuel L. Jackson. And, and he passed up yeah. on what could have been a very good opportunity. And Fishburne apparently is supposed to also play uh, Sam Jackson's part in Pulp Fiction but dicked around too much and Sam Jackson took the part. And that's why he ended up in the matrix. Yes. Both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are both referenced in this movie. At different yes, points. they are. <laughs> Actually, I think the Hillary Clinton comment is what pushes the them to realize where the bomb is at the kid's school. Yeah, because they're talking about presidents and yeah. things. Yeah. Uh, the container ship is the same model coloring and line. Uh, it's the same, whatever. Uh, it's the model ship as seen in the boardroom of the Nakatomi Towers in part one. Okay. Yeah, so I, I need to, like, I need to go back now because I want to know, does that actually look like? That's amazing attention to detail if it does. Uh, they actually did uh, tow or hook a truck to a boat to do that scene. Oh, wow. Yeah. They actually drug a boat off of the bridge? A truck off the bridge. Oh, yeah. Yep. They actually did it. Oh, my word. Um, did you know uh, Bruce Willis was born in West Germany? Idar Obernstein, West Germany. I did not. Yeah, I didn't know. <laughs> do the research for this either. Yeah, he's an American citizen, but yeah, he was he was born in Germany. He could never be president. You gotta be. Yeah, you gotta. Yeah, unless, well, it, unless it's a military base. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Know, maybe yeah. I didn't do that far. Um, Samuel L. Jackson has come out and said that Zeus is the closest character to my personality of any character I've ever played. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> yep. Dude, Zeus is a uh, dude, awesome. Just so awesome. He this. was. Um, I liked him. Uh, this was actually the highest grossing movie of 95. <laughs> 
So whoever's born in 95, there's your movie. That That's your number one movie of the year. Heck yeah. <laughs> Die Hard 3. Sean Connery was the director's first choice to play Simon, but he said he didn't want to play such a despicable villain. So the guy that wrote this was detained and questioned by the FBI um, after he completed the script because uh, the agency were alarmed by how much he knew about the heist, like how to make it happen and how much he knew about the Trade Center and everything. Um, and he said that he just did research. <laughs> like, But they wanted like, how did you know all this? Oh. Like, how did you know the, the inner workings? Of the, yeah, that. like they wanted... <laughs> Yeah, so like the FBI like grabbed him from snatched him up for a minute. It was like, dude, what like whoa. And this is like before like not eleven I mean yeah. well around the time. Anyway, uh alternate endings um of this are where John kills Simon with a rocket launcher, which is supposed to be pretty I guess he switched the arrow around or something and then it's up killing him. Um and there's a whole thing where instead of catching him in Canada, like they all get away all the way to like Hungary or Germany and John tracks him all the way there and it's this whole entire long Thing. I'm glad that they didn't do, but apparently aspirin brought a bottle had different digits or something on it that took them to Germany. Uh, okay. Oh, you know, that's where they went. But then it up being hungry instead of Germany. Yeah. And it was something weird. That's the info I got on that. Wow. To me, I love Die Hard 3. I do. Oh, I yeah. don't I don't put it where Die Hard 1 is, but how I put Lethal Weapon 1 and Lethal Weapon 2, Die Hard 1, Die Hard 3. They are very close to me. They are my two favorite Die Hards. I think Die Hard so rewatchable die hard two sort of but die hard three with a vengeance you know like even the scene i guess i can put this in the info as well uh where they drive through central park the writer yeah. had daydreamed about doing that so he put it in the movie he's like man it'd be cool to just drive through the park and just wow. do what we want it's like gta this movie to me is like gta as a movie john Mc- i mean think about it he just steals cars and like shoots people and drives through the park and just does whatever he wants. Yeah. (laughs) Like it's, I think this is just a super, super fun movie. I think a a rightful successor to Hans, like you had to find somebody awesome to play his brother. And I I think they nailed it for sure. Jeremy Irons is a nice cold character. He's smart and he's a solid actor. Oh yeah. he, He doesn't, I've never seen him in a role. I've seen some movies that suck that he's in, but I've never seen like him be shitty in a movie. So here's a question for you, though. We find out in the beginning John McClane's on suspension. Why? Um, so the only thing I can figure is because they make the comments about how his wife is estranged or they're separated or, or whatever the term they used was, and that he's a borderline alcoholic. And according to the phone call, he's not two steps away. He's one. I like that. He kept saying, no, no, one, one. Uh, like, so I, I wonder, like, maybe that had something to do with his suspension. But they never really say why he's a disgraced cop on suspension. I think he just drank too much and probably told somebody off a time or two, you know, something like that. Well, they make a mention at one point that, like, he stepped on too many toes or something. Yeah, well, he but says that what he doesn't wants. really say anything. Like, I don't know. I just wondered if it had something to do with the events of the previous movie, but I don't know. I don't know. think so. <laughs> now, I assume that he was told to do something and uh, he just said, fuck you. Like, I'm not doing it. You well, know? Maybe that's part of his uh, slow unwinding mentally. He's just losing it. Because like in the first movie, you could tell he had some form of remorse when he would kill people. Like he didn't want to be doing it. But then, as these movies progressed, like he almost enjoyed it. He's over it. He's oh jeez. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he does do it a lot more, a lot less remorse. Now, did you like that they moved away from that claustrophobic feel? They got away from the confined buildings and went more citywide. Uh, I think they needed a grander scale here. Uh, and despite the fact that the science doesn't add up with the gold bars and 14 dump, I guess they needed like 177 or 77 dump trucks to make this actually happen. Somebody did the math. Of course they did. <laughs> yeah. This is a different universe and those trucks are more sturdy. <laughs> the suspensions are better. <laughs> they have more horsepower. Well, no, they stole them. So they obviously had time to modify them. Come on, people. Yeah. Like, what? Well, come on. I do like that this was a broad, open one. I don't like movies to repeat themselves over and over again. If he would have just been stuck in a mall or stuck in another building, like, it just been like, we've done this. I mean, this is all over. Like, because of him, not that I ever would break the law in speed, but if I was going maybe more than the speed limit, sometimes you've got to find that lead blocker on the highway that's going to catch the cops for you. <laughs> and so I always think every time I'm like, there's my lead blocker. I always think of Die Hard. Like that's because just because of that scene, you know, getting that ambulance in yeah. front of them. It's I always called them gophers for go first. Emily calls them the tail. 
Like, so there's my tail. I'm like, but no, you're their tail. We do, you get up with them, <laughs> and, like, you keep passing and then letting them pass, but then pass. Don't ever let them actually get by you. It takes them off enough that they speed ahead and won't let you pass, and then you just ride yeah. behind them. And I just wait for the people of Jersey to go flying up through, because I was like, they well, don't that Or too. Maryland. There's that, you know, they just like, 90 miles. It's like, dude, if I'm doing 85 and a 55, and you pass me like I'm standing still, you're an idiot. Okay, I no, granted, I shouldn't be going that fast. Probably not, but... How fast are you going? Yeah, <laughs> like, let's, let's calm down, man. So, speaking of speeding and cars, and what did you think of some of the ridiculous stunts? Uh, well, they jump the uh, car off the one bridge when they're following the dump trucks. They jump it off, and that car should definitely have not survived. No, <laughs> it definitely does. Um, I did like the uh, the fountain deal at the end. It's not really the car thing, but where McLean shot the blowhole of the the whale <laughs> from the tunnel you know after he kills uh Niels or whatever attention fuckhead Niels is dead <laughs> you know when they open the dam yeah. and now this one doesn't have christmas in it however he does reference santa claus in the tunnels in the he aqueduct does. he does so that's carry on the christmas theme at least through this one yeah somebody pointed that out and, and that dude the, the guy that plays him uh well he's like well, he calls himself mickey o'brien aqueduct security but the, the one truck driver that he stops because he thinks he's part of it, uh, who tells him Chester A. Arthur is the school that they need to be in. Yeah. Like that, like gee, even those little casting choices right there. That guy was great. Oh, yeah. That dude was great. You know, like. It just kept rattling on. Like every police detective was on there. The bomb expert guy, like I already said, uh, the police chief with his mustache. Man, that, that dude was like straight out of Tombstone with that mustache. It was awesome. Yeah, it's just everybody was believable. I believe they were cops. They were off of the Law and Order set or something. Like they, <laughs> they, they were right there. Apparently, the DJ Elvis Duran is a real DJ. Uh, he exists. Oh, and he nice. plays himself. Yeah, uh, the villains. I don't know. They were they were raining like dogs and cats out there. They were okay. I guess they did what they needed to do. I guess the chick uh, who gets her throat slit, who she's a mute in the movie. I guess she's like an actual actress and singer. She's some famous singer somewhere. I never heard of her before, but she did what she did there. It's kind of cool. The double cross. She's like, oh, I'm banging this dude. No, I'm going to bang the, this other dude. And Yeah. You know, I'm not sure that that really needed to be in there, but you know, whatever. So what are some points of this movie that you just don't like? What don't I like about this movie? Well, like I said, I didn't really care much about the love affair thing there. Well, right. Um, or things that just kind of irk you or like, oh, that, you know. The kids in the school. The kids that go up to the other classroom because they think they're going to get busted, you know, for the TV. And I guess those kids, uh, is Eldis Hodge plays one of those kids, Hawkman in the the recent Shazam or uh, Black Adam movie. Yeah. And he plays, comes back in Die Hard 5 for a second. We'll get to that. Hmm. Um, and I, him and the, the other kid, I guess they're like related to Sam Jackson or somebody. Really? So, yeah. Oh, okay. Like his nephews or something. Something like that. I don't remember exactly what the family lineage is. Um, so I didn't. I don't believe that they would go all the way up there and to try to get away. And then the cops, they have to take them all the way up to the roof. Like that whole thing there didn't... I felt like they would have swept that building better. And so here's the deal. All the kids are in the, the auditorium. So in a fire drill, you go out and everybody's accounted for, right? So they're in the gymnasium. All the teachers should have all the kids accounted for at that point. All the, everybody's been secretly told what's going on. Like, yeah. hey, like this shit's not like we need to fucking don't mess lose, around don't here, lose right? Your kids. But apparently, one of the teachers was like, "I'm missing a few kids. Who gives a shit?" <laughs> <laughs> like, there's what is it? Three kids? Four kids up there? Four. Like, how are you missing four. four kids? Like, I don't know, man. Like that. I no. I don't buy that. Would have happened. I don't. But those are those are tid- tiddly little yeah. things. Yeah, see, for me, one of the big things I didn't like was uh, the subway payphone. When Samuel Jackson gets there quick and he jumps the turnstile, the cop who pulls his gun out is... Shaking? Li- yeah, he's literally <laughs> shaking like he's terrified yeah. of this. That, that, that was not a good acting choice. Well, like, but... he's acting like he's terrified of this guy... Well, it's a black man in New York. Or obviously he's scared. Come on. I mean that it, it's stupid, right? It's absolutely stupid. Well, see, and that was the other thing I didn't like. I'm glad you you brought that up. The first two movies, nothing about racism whatsoever. This one suddenly is like that's a major, major plot point. Yeah, and, and to think about where the first two movies are, first one, LA. Definitely some racial issues going on in LA, some some major issues back then. Uh second one, Washington, DC. Have you ever been to DC? I've been to DC. 
and everybody's angry at everybody. So at least that part I, I got, but it's but there's definitely some racial issues going on in DC as well. Like I went to a McDonald's once in DC and that lady was mean to me because I wasn't ordering my cheeseburger fast enough. It was like by the Smithsonian, man. It was, yeah, Dulles Airport. Dulles Oh, yeah, Airport. I guess you're right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I just, I didn't like how all of a sudden that was a huge, huge point of the movie. Like, Yeah, because. Why? I, I, I don't know. And then the other thing that really irks me is the ending, where he has two shots, so he perfectly shoots an electrical cable to make it fall on top of the helicopter. Like, go spit, Josh. Just go spit. I understand he's supposed to be a good shot, but he didn't. Like, you barely hit any. I don't know if any of the movies... I'll, 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 I'm going to be devil's advocate for you here, because <laughs> I don't know if anything in any of the previous movies has showed me that he's a, he's a Hawkeye. You know what I mean? No. Right. Like, Murtaugh, sh- he, dude, he's a good shot. Uh, Riggs, obviously, thousand yards out, high wind, only a thousand men, or a couple guys yeah, in the world could have McLean, that shot. nine times out of ten in a firefight, he doesn't hit anybody. In the first one, he's running away like this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because he's just a cop. Uh, now, granted, in part five, we see how great of a shot he is, but more of that's part five. No, that doesn't <laughs> exist. Oh, that was... Oh. <laughs> I'm going to get to that entire scene My uh, Lord. when we get there. It's, it's, it's on deck soon. No, it is, but movie magic. Yeah. You know, he's, he's the hero. He's got to be able to do that. I, I did like the foreshadowing. How earlier they showed, like, oh, well, you mix these two liquids, and then it's combustible, and anything that hits it... Wait, yeah. Who the guy does that with the chair in the middle of the precinct? Well, yeah, that was stupid. Like what? No. But no, then at on. the end, it, it's a blink and you miss it. It's, it's really like, fun stuff. Like he smacks with the crowbar. You know, both of them. He, he Ow! Makes, <laughs> well, that's how he blows open the handcuffs. Uh-huh. But if you're not paying attention, you think he just oh he hit with the crowbar and broke them. You know how much of a man John McClane is. He's like, do we have anything to uh, to get these handcuffs loose? Like, well, how about that piece of metal I got when I slid down? At first, I'm thinking, oh, he just had it. Somehow, he had it in his hand. No, it was like in his arm. He's like this piece, He's been running around this entire time. And I, dude, the scene where Simon is about to be the second time that Zeus has a gun and doesn't shoot anybody. Uh, yeah, it happens. <laughs> and he's just in there eating his apple or whatever it is, and he's just like. You fucking idiot. <laughs> just nonchalantly walks over, just takes it right out of his hand. He doesn't even try to fight to not let him take it. He just takes it right you out. Mean of on the ship? Yeah. <laughs> well, if you listen, you hear the click. He didn't take, I think yeah. he didn't rack it. Like, I, well, I know he didn't do the thing, but like Simon just walks, but he physically just takes it from him. Zeus just gives it to him. Doesn't even like try to hit him with it or run away. Just uh, like, like a kid just did something stupid and the parent just comes over and just snatches it out yeah. of their hand. <laughs> I mean, I'll say it again that Jeremy Irons, I think, was the perfect choice for this uh, the, the, this part. Absolutely. I stuttered a lot right there. The, 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 the gullibility of the NYPD. <laughs> no offense to anybody stirs out there. It's a yeah. different reference to the movie. But, <laughs> yeah. but no, real. I think Jeremy Irons was the perfect casting for that. It was just that stoic, almost like overly creepy attitude. Like I just, I loved it. Yeah. I like the elevator scene too. When he I everybody. put oh this God. movie below one, but above two. Yeah. Well, I sent you my rankings of the entire series. Yeah. The Lethal Weapon series and then them all mixed together because uh, I have free time. What uh, did we, I don't know, did we say? I, I didn't give my rating on this one yet. Well, 16, 16 is the kills. confirmed death count of this movie. I guess they, that's just not the people that died in all the bombs and stuff. Well, well, well. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I, I don't have it written down because uh, there's so many things to write down here. But when the subway crashes, I think something actually does like the piece of metal like does stop like so far above Sam Jackson's head. And I think that really did happen. I think it wasn't planned. Um, and I'm pretty sure that when people were running like the stuntmen were running away from the subway, it's because they actually were like running because they didn't realize that the subway when it crashed and come flying, it was actually supposed to be going that fast. So they oh, wow. were legit like shit we're gonna get like right <laughs> so so i thought that that was a cool little thing overall thoughts for me i think this is a fun movie it's like i said my second favorite uh the chemistry of the cast is amazing the dialogue and delivery i mean he's doing the, the rhymes and it's just one of those like every time somebody talks you're like whoa God, that was a good line that was a good line john mctiernan can do action he's yeah a great action director um yeah. and it's like everything he does just oozes like well, just and samuel jackson slickness. can do one-liners like yeah they <laughs> 
The like, chemistry between those two was just dynamite. Well, like the end when they fly the helicopter in while... Uh, Damn, I think she's mad at you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they shine the light on while they're getting ready to have sex and she starts shooting. <laughs> oh, that was great. Yeah, it was. I, I wish Zeus would come back in another time. You know, it's not going to happen, but it would have been nice to see his character somewhere, somehow. Just to see where he ended up. You know, but yeah, so that's that's Die Hard 3. That was 1995. 95. We are going to jump 12 years. That's a long time. 2017, when they decided to make Live Free or Die Hard, the only PG-13 Die Hard movie in the franchise. Directed by Len Wiseman. Made $134 million. It did. Rated uh, 7.1 on IMBD and 82% on Rotten Tomatoes. So the plot of this one. When a cyber criminal and his team crash much of the nation's infrastructure for greed and revenge, old school cop John McClane joins forces with a talented young hacker, saving America and his estranged daughter in the process. Well, that was a little bit of a better description. <laughs> I didn't. We didn't get to the good one yet. Oh, jeez. There's one more. <laughs> oh, man. So the big hacker, Thomas Gabriel, played by Timothy Oliphant. Oh, man, I love Timothy Oliphant. He's fucking great. He's so young in that. So young. We just watched Justified earlier this year, the, the Detroit one, the primeval. And he's, I mean, he's not like old. I mean, he's just in the Boba Fett stuff, Mandalorian. Yeah, but he's probably in his 40s. I'd say well, he's older than me. He's got to be. Even really? Walton Coggins around this age. He's got to be in their fifties, early fifties. Yeah. In this though, I mean, he had to have been late twenties, early thirties. Yeah, I think this was uh, before he did the Stephen King Alien movie, uh, where the aliens like in the toilet and bites off Jason Lee's fingers. I don't know. You know, I had Sam Jackson in too. I think um, Pet Cemetery. No, <laughs> no, definitely not that one or two. Spelled T W O. Yeah, Bruce Willis, uh, Justin Long plays Matt Farrell, hacker turned white hat. Mary Elizabeth Weinstead shows up as Lucy Gennaro and not Lucy McLean. Maggie Q. Oh, yeah, last she, I saw her, she was bumming the elevator shaft with this SUV yeah. of ass. <laughs> Maggie Q is my Lynn, Gabriel's second hand in command lover person. Kevin Smith shows up for a minute as Frederick Warlock Claudius. Love that cameo. Yeah, um, those are the major people. Uh, there's a French dude in here who jumps around, and does a bunch of crazy stuff. Yeah, that was some pretty amazing acrobatics. Cyril Raffaelli as Rand, Gabriel's acrobatic henchman, it says. <laughs> All right. So I will be honest with you. I never really liked Justin Long. I, I like him in comedies like Waiting. Yes, yes. Uh, but... I've seen him in a few supposed to be serious movies. I just, I never cared for him. I actually liked him in this because he basically played a completely clueless 20 year old. And I feel like that's what he's best at playing a clueless character. Yeah. I mean, I can't think of the name of there's a horror movie from like a year or two ago uh, where he, there's something crazy going on underneath the house and he plays like this complete douchebag director guy from Hollywood. And it's set in Detroit and like the, the rundown part of Detroit where everything's abandoned and it's it's just wild. Uh, I'll have to find the name of that and bring it up. Cool he, story, bro. <laughs> yeah, he, he's really, really... He plays... The, he just plays like a dirty type dude and even here he looks like he needs a shower. Yeah. He's so dirty. And he goes, why Why were all these people after you? Like, you dumbass, they're not after me, you idiot. Yeah, so Timmy, Timmy, Timmy Oliphant's character, Gabriel, is really mad because the government was mean to him and said his ideas were stupid. Um, he tried to, to save... Uh, the government from another 9-11 and other things. Uh, apparently he hacked uh, the NSA or something with uh, with his laptop or something. I don't know. He did some crazy thing. They kicked him out. Well, now he wants revenge. And what's better than revenge? Getting paid more money for it. Fire sale. Yeah, fire sale. Um, the film's plot is based on a, an early script uh, entitled World War Three or WW3.com by uh, David Marconi, who is the screenwriter of Enemy of the State. Shocker, you know, those are, you know, kind of similar yeah. movies. Director Len Wiseman was only 15 when he saw the first Die Hard. Uh, so one time back at home, he made his own version of the film in his own backyard with his family's uh, video camera. 20 years later, he got to direct Live Free or Die Hard. Um, and he would use a fight scene from the home movie that he made into the movie. 
So that was uh, was pretty cool that he was in love with Die Hard as much as he was as a kid. Yeah. And able to finally direct it and be like, you know what? I made this scene when I was a kid. I'm going to throw that up in there. I wonder what scene it was. I'm not sure. Um, I don't know. But apparently they used Wiseman as one of the last names of one of the cops in the movie, too. Nice. And uh, he, I think he's uh, Len Wiseman is F-35B pilot. He does a cameo. I think that was uh, where he ejects out of there. Yeah. Uh, in addition to the Agent Johnson reference, several other elements of the first Die Hard are, are revisited. Among them are crawling a broken glass, use of air ducts, elevator shafts, and maintenance areas in corporate buildings, and a henchman falling downstairs, an inquiry on the ETA of the helicopter, and McLean's yippee ki yay yay catchphrase. But as you said, this is PG-13, so... It was yippee ki yay mother, and then there was noise. Yeah. Uh, French act, like I said before, French actor and martial artist Cyril Raphael, who plays Rand, does his own stunts almost the entire movie without any special effects. Um, but he did do it with, with wires, or without wires, I guess. I guess the dude was just, like, crazy athletic. Like, he was like, oh, was there a circus in town? I yeah. like how the guy, the, he sees the gun, he like, turns to the side like Wiley e. Coyote, slips down to grab the gun, then gets knocked over. He <laughs> just goes into the mulcher. <laughs> and I believe Bruce Willis's exact words were, oh! Yeah. Uh, the film addresses the apparent continuity era of an early installment. Uh, McLean is afraid of flying in Die Hard and Die Hard 2. But not in this, uh, not in Die Hard with a Vengeance. Uh, here it explains that he took flying lessons to face his fears. But he skipped a few. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, like I don't know. Uh, uh, it took four months to assemble the uh, presidential video package to put all those presidents together where he says, oh, I tried to get more Nixon. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's a long time. Four months? For all those clips together? That's a lot of uh, speech watching, I guess. I believe that. Uh, this is the first Die Hard without Michael Kamen. Uh, because he had passed away. So mm. we instead get uh, Marco Beltrami, who I'm pretty sure has done a crap ton of other movies. And finally, Scott Speedman was Len Wiseman's first choice for the role of Matt Farrell, where Ben Affleck was Bruce Willis's first choice for the role. So Ben Affleck could have been the hacker dude. I don't know. That, that would have been a little strange. Yeah. Uh, Willis wanted Affleck in order to recreate the chemistry between the two characters that they had uh, had together in Armageddon. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, Cal Penn and Brad Renfro both auditions for the role of Matt before it went to Justin Long. Yeah, um, this movie is wild. I mean, he still throws cars at helicopters and tries to kill people. It was kind of cute listening to Justin Long complain about the old music that he listens to, but it's CCR. It's like not super yeah. old and it's class. I mean, like, and I'm not saying that because I'm an older dude, but like there's young people that still listen to CCR. Like, and so, he was referencing like some bands that nobody listens to anymore. <laughs> right. The, I, Flyleaf is in this though at the beginning, and that that's a dope ass song. I, I it's a really kick ass so song. So, what do you uh, rate this movie? Uh, I'm not gonna look at my paper. I'm just gonna say I give this a seven out of ten. See, I give it an eight because I, being a, a you know computer person myself, loved that they they took this franchise and pushed it into a new technology era. I don't have an issue with that at all. And I just, I absolutely loved seeing McLean clueless. Like when he, he covers the webcam and he whispers, can you, can you track <laughs> we him? We can still he, hear you, you idiot. <laughs> and Timothy Oliphant plays it so beautifully because he's just like, he's not, he's not an ass. He's just like, hey, just because you cover the camera doesn't mean I can't hear you. <laughs> like, <laughs> almost like he's trying to educate him. Like, you're, you're an idiot. Come on, Grandpa. Yeah, I, I just. I don't know if he'd be that clueless to everything, but. You know, but it, he plays it well. He does play it well. He does. And I, I really, really enjoyed that part. What am I? Uh, oh, the whole idea. Uh, the one thing I found online, people were saying it was an analog hero in a digital world. I can see that. And I just, I think that should have been the tagline. Like, that was perfect. Well, if you even look all the way back to the first movie when he shows up and he's already blown away by everything that's even in California. Like, just a little bit there. He's, he's like, oh, California. Oh, fucking California. Oh, yep. California. Like, everything's just like, oh, like, he's been living in a box somewhere. Like, he was only on six city blocks of New York for his entire life. He's never left. He's like Charlie and Sonny in Philadelphia, and he never leaves Philadelphia. Yep. <laughs> like, just kind of lost everywhere else he goes. Well, I mean, because everywhere else he goes, he does the most ridiculous shit, yeah. like well, riding I, a fighter jet. Yeah, that, some of the stuff just got a little bit more and more. Uh, you were talking about him getting suspended from uh, the force and shit in the last one. And this one here, he seems to just be a plain Jane, not really 
and even Gabriel makes fun of him later on. He's like, oh man, you've been in the force for this long. You haven't where like, this is where you're at. Where's your pension? Yeah. Like yeah. Dude, it's gone. He's like, you never like leveled up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like you're playing D and D's like you've all leveled up to three. Now I'll stay at two. Like, I just, yeah, there's too many choices. I'm going to stay at two. If you don't mind. Can I do, can I just stay at two? <laughs> I'll just take a feet. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. He's just, and he's just part of the problem for me in this one even though I do enjoy it and I'm not going to bash on it a lot, but Bruce Willis in this one is kind of, I'm not saying he's lazy in this one, but he, uh, I think he, there's a couple scenes. He kind of owns it just, just a little bit. And he's a lot more tempered in this one, a lot more, uh, deliberate in the things he does. He doesn't just wildly go crazy. Now the fight with Maggie Q gets off the walls nuts. I I don't driving a car up. What? Four floors to drive it down an elevator shaft. (laughs) Yeah, pretty wild. But he just, he's more calm in the way, like when he's in the tunnel and he needs to to throw the car. Um, And listen, I don't know if you've ever, I don't know, fallen off a four-wheeler or a bicycle. (laughs) But if you're driving, what is he driving, like 65, 70, and he just like, I think he, does he say this is going to hurt? Yeah, and he dives out. But dude, he shattered his elbow. Dude, your elbow shattered. He, he, when you watch that scene and he jumps out, like he lands on his elbow first. Like that arm's done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> At least he's got adamantium. <laughs> and he's got a healing factor. Like that's and done. That kind of momentum, he's probably going to oh. pull into a vehicle and crush himself. Yeah, I, this one, like I said, it's fun. It's just a little bit too over the top at times for me yeah i still enjoy it though like i watched it again because this is maybe my third or fourth time watching it this go around i still had fun with it but i was like well that's stupid well that's unbelievable but there 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 are parts that i still enjoyed i liked thomas gabriel as the bad dude uh, tim leo font's good mm-hmm. i did like you know they go in there and they they take over the the main power grid station you know it, it kind of a throwback to the to the first couple movies where the villains were like on point. They did their research. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure why he killed all of his analyst people, like his tech guys. I assume loose ends, maybe just I, no witnesses and less people to share with. But wouldn't you want to wait to make sure your mission's like done first? He kept, he kept one. Uh, the FBI, we don't really talk about them yet in this movie. The FBI guy was pretty cool. I uh, the guy that was leading them. He, he was a sassy dude. And I enjoyed the turnaround previous uh, opposed to previous movies so mclean shows up hey this is going on something's not right uh you're fucking wrong get out of here you're an idiot goodbye now he sort of does it a little bit at first but then it's luckily Justin long says something and he's like well let's not talk about the fire, fire sale but then like he's like wait a minute this might make sense like the guy didn't wasn't just like no this is all wrong um and i did like that john mclean didn't just completely throw Justin Long's ideas out either. It's like, you know, you well, tell me, no, 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 seriously, tell me more about this. I know nobody's yeah. believing you. You tell me. Or like when he called Kevin Smith, he's like, hey, do whatever it is you do, but <laughs> patch me into dispatch. Yeah. It's like he, uh, he's already been through enough crazy wild shit that he's like, you know what? This might actually be real. Yeah. I mean, I've been on a towering inferno and all this other crazy stuff. This could be it. So what do you, what do you think? I've been rambling here about this movie. Uh, what, what's, you said you gave it an eight. I gave I it a give seven. I give it an eight. I love the technology side of things. I didn't like that it was PG thirteen, just because I I liked that freedom that they gave him in the other movies, where like he could make comments weren't scripted that worked beautifully. You know, what I mean, when you go PG thirteen, I feel like you're a lot more restricted to the script because they don't want to risk you saying something off. Do you think because of how many years later from the previous installment this was, they're like, well, maybe, because I have a feeling they were doing a lot of PG-13 movies at this time. Uh, do you think that they're like, well, maybe, if we're bringing Die Hard back, we need a broader audience and like we need more people and more, more butts in the seats? I don't know. Rated R movies don't make as much money, they say. Well, Deadpool would disagree, but I think they might have alienated a couple people with a... It's the same as when you have horror movie series, the first four are brutal, they're gory... They're R-rated, and then you show up with like a Scream type sequel, and you're like, "Well, it's a good movie, but it's I want to see somebody's head get hacked off, you know? Like here, I want to see him like shoot somebody in the face yeah. and say, "Fuck you." Like Halloween Three, Season of the Witch. Had yeah, nothing to do with Michael Myers. No, but it didn't have Tom Atkins. That was in Lethal Weapon One. Is Michael Hudsacker? So <laughs> there's that. All in all, I really enjoyed this movie. I don't think I would put it above two or three, but at the same time. 
it's one of those movies that I could easily sit down and rewatch. But it's not the worst movie of the franchise. Not by far. No. Now, do you, uh, would you put this movie above any of the Lethal Weapons? Yeah, I would put this above three and four. Okay, well, that's a valid opinion. You want to roll on to the final installment of this? I'm, I mean... Uh, we could just end it here and be happy. <laughs> Oh no, we the part five needs its flowers, as people are saying a lot these days. It deserves its due. You know, uh, <sighs> in a couple years, you'll be like, well, actually, if you really think about it, part five is probably the best of the series. No, no one's gonna say that. <laughs> five years, five years, I'm oh yeah, after live free or die hard, we got a good day to die hard from 2013. Yep, a 5.2 on IMDb. Rotten Tomatoes, 15%. 15%, man. That, that's, woo. John McClane travels to Russia to help his estranged son, Jack, played by Jay Courtney, who has been arrested for an assassination attempt. He soon learns that Jack is a CIA operative working to prevent a nuclear weapons heist. The two must put aside their differences and work together to stop the global threat. Now, that's what I have for this movie. <laughs> this is the last movie, which means the one that you kept saying is horrible has to be this one. So please, Michael, what is your I just movie? want to know if you agree with what I'm about to say here that I took from Bruce Willis is back in action. Mind blowing, heart stopping, rip roaring action as John McClane, the heroic New York cop with a knack for being in the wrong place at the right time. That's it. That's that's what they wrote. So I wrote a bunch of asterisks next to it. Russia, Chernobyl, his son. My word. <laughs> Dude, like rip roaring, mind blowing, heart stopping. <laughs> what part of this movie is rip roaring? What part of this is mind blowing? Mind blowing. Heart stopping. <laughs> mind blowing is the amount of money they spent on that chase scene. Yeah, so uh, this movie made $67 million. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, hey. Yeah, so we get Bruce Willis back. Uh, Jai Courtney plays his son, John, <laughs> parentheses, Jack McClane. He called, he, he called, keeps calling him Jack, but then later on he's like, he says, I'm John Mc, I'm the John McClane. He goes, John McClane Jr. But like, yeah. why, why did he, I don't know, but then he's yelling Jack later on because uh, he's on vacation, uh, but he's not really on vacation. <laughs> so, so, so here's the deal. Oh, okay. I'm just going to lay it out here for you. Okay. So we don't even know Jai Courtney exists. We don't know that it's his son. Uh, so John McClane is in the shooting range. That's somehow also a detective's desk place. Yeah. <laughs> There's like two dirty desks. It looks like it's from a fucking uh, part of a saw movie. <laughs> I'm waiting for some dude in a tricycle to come out. Uh, so this dude walks up. He calls him Poppy. You know, he was from Prison Break. And he's like, yeah, I found him. I found him for you, Poppy. I found him. <laughs> so he finds out that his son uh, is in Russia. Um, they, they do show Jai Courtney is going to, or he goes and murders somebody. Yeah. In the middle of a club. You don't really know why he's wearing this dude in the club. You have no idea. And part of the issues I had is the copy that I had first off kept jumping when I was trying to watch it. And I had no subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of rushing going on that I was like, I have no idea what they're saying right now, but that's okay. I can just make it up. It's, it's fun. <laughs> and, but I've seen this with, with subtitles. So okay. it's okay. I saw, but this is my only second time watching it. So he's like, John McClane just gets on a plane, <laughs> flies to Russia. Like nobody's business. There's riots going out along this courthouse where Jai Courtney's character and, uh, this other important character are going to, be given their sentencing. And he's just walking. He's just up walking. Up. There's like tear gas going on. Uh, <laughs> so he's just walking through and there's there's stuff going on. He, he's just nonchalantly walking. Like he doesn't even care what's going on. And he just stands and he just stares at the court building. And he stares and then he stares. And But don't worry, there's a truck that drives down an alleyway, but that catches his attention. Sort of like the baggage claim in part two. But then, he, <laughs> but then he looks back. He's like, well, it's just a truck and it's Russia and there's army people everywhere. What, no big deal. <laughs> like... Like, what is going on here? John McClane, uh, Bruce Willis is so uninspired in this movie. Oh, yeah. He barely has any dialogue. This felt like a paycheck. So around this time, he was doing other movies uh, such as G.I. Joe 2 and Red 2. Have you ever seen those classics? No, I won't admit to that. Yeah, it's whew. so. I mean, he, even in those movies, he, he really wasn't doing much. And he eventually did the Death Witch remake. And he's like, 
he doesn't do anything of of any uh emotional range. All the other things I've seen Bruce Willis in, like he's been pretty fantastic. We had around this time he started doing a lot of direct video movies. I don't know if at this point his aphasia and dementia was starting to kick in or not. Yeah. But I feel like it might have been. Uh Aaron Paul and Liam Hemsworth. Uh that's right, the new Gerald of Rivera. Uh were considered for Jack. Um Bruce Willis said this uh he said he wanted to do an, an additional installment for a good day to die hard. Uh, before returning his character, however, March 2022, uh, he retired from acting due to his uh, his illness. The Russian gang member uh, had no actual Russian members in it. The Russian gang, no Russian members in it at all. Uh, the roles were played by Slovakian, Hungarian, Serbian, and Mongolian and Ukrainian actors. Uh, this is the first Die Hard sequel since Die Hard 2, where a performer besides Bruce Willis has reprised their cameo role. Um, I read that they cut out all of Elizabeth Weinstead's stuff, but she's in the very end of the movie I watched when they get off on the tarmac. So I don't know if she was in it more somewhere and they cut it out. Arab Jacobus, I think is his name, and his stunt team designed and filmed a, a screen test of the fight scene between Bruce Willis and the dancer dude. The scene would have had John McClane being attacked by a knife with the guy, but the choreography wasn't used, so it was like completely cut out, so it was like a whole waste of time. And I completely forgot that in the previous movie, Bruce was his stunt man was seriously hurt, like horribly bad. I think some of my stuff got deleted off my thing here. But anyway, he was like hurt, seriously hurt, like he shra- like shattered like femur or something, something crazy. But Bruce Ow. Willis paid for his, uh, it was where he was supposed to, I think, jump on one of the um, stairways outside of the windows uh, when they were sliding down. And I think like something slipped or something. Okay. But Bruce Willis played for all his medical bills. Oh, and the scaffolding. Yeah, the scaffolding. Okay. Yeah. So Bruce Willis like visited him in the hospital and stuff, paid all his medical bills. And oh, things. wow. Um, and apparently there's a scar that's supposed to be somewhere Bruce Willis's face that don't show up from the previous movie. So yeah, there's just a lot of inconsistencies in these last two movies. Just, this movie's a train wreck, dude. Like I, I, I can't ramble on this forever. It's, it's messy. Uh, I, Jai Courtney was great in Spartacus. I think he was really cool, and I think he has. He's just not given anything really good to do. I feel like he tries his best to be mad at his dad, but they don't ever say why he's really mad at his dad. So he was a punk in high school. He, he got in trouble with the law. He wasn't but, there. He was working all the time. So my thing is, though, in the previous movie, Lucy and John don't get along because of the divorce. Yeah. They patch it up, right? At the end of the movie, they're good. She's going to bang Justin Long. They're going to make maybe <sighs> whatever, right? They're good to go. So don't you think at some point she would have contacted her brother like, yo, Dad's actually not as big as douchebag as we think. You know, don't you think it was on the news that he was this whole thing happened? John McClane, yeah. you know, he was part a spec ops or whatever he is. He's part of the military. He's got to know things are going on, right? So, like, but he's still a dick to his dad, but you don't know why. Like, what, what's so, but don't worry, they solve it. They all go to Chernobyl. They don't get poisoned uh, because there, there's secret stuff in the vault in Chernobyl with some fancy lights because that's, you know, UV lights. Uh, yeah, UV lights. UV lights uh, kill Somebody went radiation. there at some point to install them. That way, when they could come back later, they would be there. And the whole plot is stupid. I don't really 100% understand it to this. I, I don't know. What do you I'm right. I'm really going on here. Well, it's <laughs> the shortest of the movies. It was only like an hour and a half. All the other ones were about two hours. It, it felt like it was three hours long, dude. Jeez. I liked some of the dynamic between them. Like, you know, okay, cool. Yeah, We got a, a father-son thing going on here. But he got old really quick. I like how he just drives away from his dad, though. Yeah. <laughs> just drives, where are you going? He's just a fucking asshole. He just drives away. You shouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> that part was cool. He's just like, screw you, dad. But can you imagine how quick the movie would end if he had just shot his dad and be like, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> Cole Hauser. Cole Hauser up in this mm. piece. Completely wasted. What a good actor, man. Completely wasted in this. Uh, but yeah, uh, Foxy is played by um, the kid from their... From part three, can't think of his name. Hawkman, Hawkman's up in this. Yeah, I can't remember his name. Yeah, I'm sorry, folks. You can tell we're definitely losing our, our mind on this. The one. kid. Yeah, the kid. Yeah. Yeah, grown up. Uh, he was in Supernatural, too. I can't remember his name. We'll figure it out. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he was in there for like two minutes. I mean, th- th- there was some, like, the villain, he's dancing around. He's like taking the dialogue. John McClane doesn't care. Jai Corden doesn't care. I don't care. You don't care. Nobody cares about this movie. I don't know, other than you, maybe Josh, my buddy Ryan. Like, other than that, like, maybe a handful of people have ever seen this movie. I think I said something to John when we were kayaking the other day about watching these, and he was just like, eh. Oh, of course. Yeah, they're, like, they're still too cool. Like, did you ever see him? Well, I, I think he likes, like, uh, part one, but I was like, have you ever seen, like, part five? And he's like, no. Well, 
I mean, <laughs> despite, I don't blame them though. Who has? But despite all the mixed reviews, this movie still brought in three hundred and four million dollars worldwide. Yeah, it's worldwide though. Sixty-five That's, mil domestic. It was still considered a commercial success. Yeah, I, I wasn't. I think I read somewhere that in like Japan or China or something, this movie's like really big. <laughs> like what? <laughs> Not in Russia. Like Taiwan or something. It's like gangbusters. Jeez. <laughs> it's weird because like Star Wars over there, like nobody will watch those movies over there. No, <laughs> but I will they'll watch Die Hard 5. I would definitely say though, uh, Marco, was it, Beltrami? Yeah, his. He did wonderful music for this. Yeah. The score I, was a, the score, score was good. The score was very well done. It's just the visuals were not well done. This whole thing at the end with the helicopter blades. Like, get out of here, man. Just get out of here. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. We got to start doing, like, if we ever do a show about, like, movies that uh, one of them definitely sucks at, we got to start doing, like, the shitty one at first. <laughs> I mean, that means we would have to rank them. We don't do ranking things that much anymore. But what do you give this movie? <laughs> I gave this a six. If you say a, what? Six out of ten. Okay. I was like, if you say eight out of ten, I'm telling you what, I will cancel my part of this podcast. I give it a six out of 10 as well. This movie sucks. It's just like some weird stuff. I just, I can't get over the courthouse thing. Why yeah. is he just walking through the crowd of people? Like, what's his goal? And then he's like, he just stands in front of the vehicle. Then there's the whole thing with the cabbie. And I've seen that guy in other movies. He's all right. Oh, but, yeah. But then just thinking, you know, it reminded me of Euro Trip when he's like, Miami Vice, number one new show. <laughs> it's like, hey, yeah. he's good for you. Hey, he's good stuff. Like, why? That's, you could have cut that whole part out. So he gets in the cab to drive like two minutes. And then, so the cab guy, he's like, you should just get out here. It'd probably be easier for you, right? Yeah. He's and like, so he gets oh, out. It's, and it's what, right there. Three blocks away. And it's not that bad. But if you, did you notice that when he gets out of the car, walks away, like five other people get out of their cars and walk away yes. from their cars. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> is this army? Like, is there something like some cataclysmic thing happening? Just everybody. But, but oh, the Americans out. So we're, it's cooler for us to go now. Right. So total deaths in all of the Die Hard movies. Ah, uh, it's like five hundred two or something. No, three seventy four. Three seventy four. Two hundred and something of that is from the airplane crash. Wow. In uh, two. Well, it's you know could have been more. Could have been more. So overall, there's that. What do you think of the entire franchise overall? What do you? Well, get? I didn't get to the commercials yet. Yeah, uh, Die Hard commercials, baby. My so, apologies. Please continue. Yeah. So they they were never really going to make another one of these. They had uh, talked about possibly on Hulu making this a TV show, like rebooting it. We're going to make this a Hulu show, but that was back in 2021. $502 million all is what they made all together. Uh, but he did show back up for some dot two diehard commercials. So that is luckily part five is not the last time we saw John McClane. Last time we saw him was actually doing some cool shit just to get a car battery and That's I'll true. take it. <laughs> it will fucking take it. See, I'm afraid I, I'm afraid of lethal weapon doing one of these. As their part five. I was always mad because, oh man, that series has one more movie than Lethal Weapon. But that's what I said. If they do bring it back, be careful. Yeah, let's not make up from Russia with idiotic love. Every time a series or a movie series comes back, they mess it up. Usually do. Like, yeah. If you're going to bring it back, don't worry about being politically correct. Don't worry about getting canceled. Make it original. Make it what it was. That's what people want to see. Go back to the basics. Yes, that's what they want to see. They don't... They can do, if you, look, look, I know it's not part of our series, but you look like the movie Extraction with Hemsworth on Netflix. Mm. That was like a back to the basics, knuckle dusting, bl knocking people through walls type thing. And it's, a, it's, that's, it's gritty. It's in your face. You know, yeah. it's good shit. And that's unfortunately, you know, but if Lethal Weapon can get a TV show, why can't die hard? I mean, I don't think they should do it. I think it should take time. Let's put this on the shelf a minute. It's like X Men. Like, let's yeah. wait a minute. Uh, overall, I mean, though, like, the entire series, it, it, I still think it's good, despite the major issues I have with five and the somewhat issues I have with four. Die Hard one, two, and three, fucking amazing, dude. Oh yeah, and Barry. four may not be the best, but it's still, it's still a good. It's still pretty. Good. It's the good. That's it's better than five. There's a reason that we did. A double episode, one on Lethal Weapon, one on Die Hard, because these movies are just, they're so fun to watch. And, and I Die feel Hard like they really complement each other and they go hand in hand. Yes, they do. And that's, I was glad I watched them back and forth. You want, watch I one, should have done other, it that way. One. Well, then maybe you would have, uh, I wish you would have ran out of time and not been able to watch part five. <laughs> 
You know what? I was messaging you, and, and we're like, we're shoot, just shooting back. We're like, what was your favorite one? I was like, dude, if this motherfucker says five, <laughs> if this guy's like all that no, rough one. I really liked four, but that's just because I see it from a different point of view. I thought you were going to be a part two guy. I really did. I did really like two, though, as well. Yeah. But I think three has got to be pretty pretty high up. Yeah. It's it's hard. Like some days, I'm like, yeah, let's go with that classic one. But then I'm like, no, nah, I mean, I just want some craziness at three. Yeah. Well, three was nonstop. Like there was no downtime from the first explosion to the final explosion in part three. Once it gets yeah. going, it's going and going and going. And that's what I liked about those earlier movies. And maybe that's the issue what I have in four and definitely in five. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stupid chitter chatter going on that you do not need in these movies. This is true. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's do some outros, man. Let's get us out of here. These viewers are tired of us rambling. All right. Let's send them on out. Well, hopefully you enjoyed our take on the Die Hard franchise. This has been your Christmas in July. Part two. Part two. Part two. If you're on YouTube, Spotify, whatever, wherever you're listening to us, make sure if you can hit that thumbs up button. Give us a like. Give us a subscribe. Leave a comment if you can. Let us know what you thought. Let us know what we should be doing differently. Or heck, let us know what else you want to see us do. Just let us know and we're more than happy to uh, maybe even get a hold of you and figure out exactly what we're going to do with what you want us to do. Did you catch all that? I did. I'm sorry. There's a yellow face coming through the door and like I, he's... Well, we better hurry. If you really like what you're hearing, you can go to patreon.com slash treeofgeek. For only five dollars a month, you can join our Patreon and get access to. Wait a minute, five dollars? That's all I have to pay? That's a steal! Yeah, I know, I know it is, and it gives you access to surveys where you can vote on upcoming episodes. You can Thanks, add. Thanks, I appreciate that. Man. You can add your input on uh, certain episode topics, such a great example I gave last time, The Crossing Swords. You could give your your input on who you felt should have won or who's going to win, and we will take that into account when you know we what episode, episode you should do. What the greatest scenes featuring Skeletor, my greatest victories. Anyways, you'll also get early access to upcoming content, as well as some behind-the-scenes uh, sound clips, videos, pictures. Who knows what you're going to find on there? Probably some more Skeletor out there. trying to think. he was jibber-jabbering <laughs> earlier, man. We yeah. had to cut him off. I would have left already, but Beastman, as usual, was late. You know where you are? <laughs> you're a hit earlier, baby. You're going to die. Gah. You also receive a shout-out from us every episode. So shout out to John for being our very first Patreon subscriber. Thank you very much for joining us and even joining us on air sometimes. And a big thank you to Unconfined You for being our first ever paid subscriber. Thank you for believing in us and throwing money our way so that we can continue doing this and hopefully Greatly soon appreciate it, man. upgrade some of our equipment. So all of that being said, thank you for joining us on this Christmas in July. I'm sorry, a diehard Christmas in July. From the Tree of Geek, this is Josh saying take care, everybody. This is Michael, and thanks for listening. Uh, we'll catch you in the Tree Fort in a couple weeks. And uh, thank you to our special, special guest, uh, even though he's a bit rowdy. Thank you for being here, uh, Lord uh, Master of Eternia. Well, thank you very much for having me. I would like to be around some more. I'm kind of bored these days before shooting starts on my new movie. So thank you very much, and I'll see you all later. Goodbye. There's no snare in my headphones.